Tasmania, or Tassie, is an island state, 240 kilometers, or 149 miles, to the south of the Australian continent. It is Australia's most mountainous state, and one of the most mountainous islands in the world. Tassie is just a bit smaller than Sri Lanka, but with a fraction of the population, with just over 500,000, of whom almost half reside in Greater Hobart. Hobart sits on a broad and benign stretch of the Derwent River, and is built on seven gently rolling hills, wooded with the tall, grey-green eucalypts that cover most of the island. At its back stands Mount Wellington, less than a mile from the sea. The city is full of notable 19th-century architecture around the Salamanca Place and Sandy Bay areas. Hobart is the place to be on the weekend when the Salamanca Arts Courtyard hosts Rectango. And people pour into the city to visit the Salamanca Market. From what the locals told us, there was one place we had to start. We had to see Mona, the deeply eccentric Museum of Old and New Art. A short boat ride from the harbor took us to the source of all the fuss. <laughs> Mona is essentially an underground lair, gouged deep into the sandstone cliffs, full of art. By subverting the solemnity of a typical museum, it seems to free everyone up to enjoy the art a little more receptively. On your iPod guide, you can find, alongside the more standard gallery notes, a few random and irreverent perspectives on each piece, all under the priceless title, Art Wake. Less than an hour's drive south of Hobart lies Kettering, where you catch the car ferry for the 15-minute ride over to Bruny Island. Bruny Island is made up of a north and south island, separated by a narrow isthmus called the Neck. We drove across the isthmus to Adventure Bay on South Bruny Island and stopped by the Penguin Cafe for lunch. We were greeted by this sign that said, If you don't book, we won't cook. We quickly realized that in a small town on Bruny Island, we couldn't assume that a place would be operating if they didn't know customers were coming. We boarded one of the boats at Bruny Island Cruises for a chance to see sights and wildlife that would otherwise be inaccessible, such as these sheer dolerite cliffs. Tasmania has the world's largest areas of dolerite, a stone harder than granite. We came right up close to these remarkable caves. And the blowhole. and these fur seals lounging on the rocks. Or swimming alongside of us. The boat had a shallow draft that allowed it to approach close to the shore.
The most exhilarating part of the cruise was where the Tasman Sea met the Southern Ocean. We rode the moderate swells, accompanied by a school of flying dolphins. Afterwards, we made our way to Anala, a conservation property run by the noted naturalist, Dr. Tonya Cochran. So you've got things like wallabies and uh, native hens and all that sort of stuff that are coming in here. Bush birds like robins, our robins, which are the flycatcher type robins, um, that like moving into the open areas to feed and then moving back into the bush to breed. The 40 spotted partilote is probably our flagship species here. That's um, on the endangered list and it's also one of the 12 Tasmanian endemics and that is um, in 1986 when they first did the first census of the population to work out you know whether it was in trouble or not this this um, colony they formed little colonies this colony which is colony number 65 on their list had 12 birds in it and now it's got over 70 birds. So uh, in 86 they did, uh, did the census. 1990 I took over this property and 96 there were 70 birds. So I like to think that that's been some positive uh, response to what I've been doing. Uh, these days I do mostly bird and wildlife watching tours. So she's a totally different thing. You can see these are uh, uh, redneck wallabies or Bennett's wallabies. And she's a Tasmanian paddy melon, or Rufus belly paddy melon. This is the, his brother. Well, not really his brother. They're from two separate mums. Aww. So these guys both came in as tiny little pouch young. Aww. And they're still on milk, but only just. Get rid of this. So they lost their mothers? or They lost their mothers, yeah. I'll show you a picture of him when he was a baby. You'd hardly recognise that... Uh, he just was, had no fur and he was about as big as his whole head is now. How did the albino wallabies get started here? They're just a rare genetic mutation, you know, like albino anything. Uh, but because we don't have predators here and because people think they're kind of cute, uh, they survive to being adults and that gene gets perpetuated through the, the colony. That's why their eyes look um, pink right. because there's no masking uh, pigment. So, so you can just see in through to the blood vessel. He loves sunbaking. Oh, really? He'll most likely have his uh, eyes, you know, almost closed. Very photosensitive. These being males will probably end up, yeah, double this size. You pretty well know when you're not doing the right thing because they uh, get diarrhea really easily right. and everything. So you've just got to vary the milk until you get it just right. So they just have a bit of milk morning, morning and night. Do you want your old teeth back? Oops. I'll change the teat on that. You can, oh sorry, you, if you can do now. Big girl, aren't you? Here, there. Is that better? That's your usual teat. Stop being a baby. <laughs> I'm trying to change them over because they just chew on the ends. You've had yours. After meeting Tanya's rescues, we checked into our comfortably spacious accommodation on the property. Later, Dr. Cochran took us on a birding walk. Quite a rare finch, one of the grass finches, our only native finch. That night, with Tonya booking ahead for us, we had a delicious meal at the nearby pub of locally caught calamari and a fish fillet. We were the only ones eating early, so if we hadn't booked, they wouldn't have cooked. The next morning, we made our way to South Bruny Island Lighthouse, where we spotted an echidna burrowing. They are sometimes known as spiny anteaters. Echidnas and the platypus are the only egg-laying mammals. The echidna's diet consists largely of ants and termites. At dusk, we made our way to the isthmus to see the fairy penguins make their way from the sea to their rookeries. We covered our flashlights with red cellophane, 
If you want to photograph, you turn off the flash. Both of these actions help protect the eyes of the birds and reduce the intrusiveness of our observations. Visitors are advised to keep to the boardwalk. If you go on the beach, the penguins won't come ashore. <laughs> the volunteer ranger gave us an informative briefing. Longer. Um, they use darkness as a cover to hide themselves from predators, which is why they come back all at once at night. Um, in fact, the little penguin, or the fairy penguin, the one we see here, it's the only real nocturnal penguin. Yellow-eyed penguins in New Zealand often come in in the dark or in the evening, but these ones really come in in the dark. Um, so this is fully grown, 30 or 40 centimetres, so about a foot long from its beak to its tail. They weigh about one kilogram, about two pounds. Um, so they're the smallest of the penguin species. They're swimming in the ocean like this, and this is protective coloration or counter shading, it's a form of camouflage. So when they're swimming and there's a predator above them, either a, a flying predator like a big gull or a sea eagle, something like that, the bat blends in with the dark ocean underneath. Or if there's a fur seal or a killer whale or something above them. Yeah? If there's a predator below, then their white belly will tend to blend with the light coming from the sky through the sea above. It does have a little hook on the end of its bill, and if you ever get to see inside a penguin's mouth, it's full of um, sharp points, barbs. Its tongue has barbs on it. Um, they don't have teeth, but no birds have teeth. And the rest of its mouth has little barbs or points. So when it catches a fish um, in the ocean, all the points sort of face backwards down its throat. So it grabs hold of the fish, the fish can't get out, and the only way the fish can go really is downwards. So that helps them catch, catch their fish. They're getting ready for their molt. Birds need to replace their feathers. The feathers get damaged, and if you're a swimming bird, you have to replace all your feathers at once. Um, especially if you swim in cold water or, or you'll get cold. Um, so, a lot of the birds are out to sea for about a month at the moment and they don't come back at all at night and then they'll come back and they'll spend two or three weeks on land without feeding. So they have to get big and fat and then come back um, so they can change their feathers. The Port Arthur Historic Site is located on the Tasman Peninsula, renowned for its rugged coastline, comprised of rocky outcrops, beaches and spectacular rocky formations including one of the most unusual in the world, the tessellated pavement. A tessellated pavement is a rare feature that appears in flat sedimentary rock formations on some ocean shores. The pavement bears this name because the rock has fractured into regular rectangular blocks that resemble tiles or tessellations. There are two main types of formations in the tessellated pavement, with the pan formations being concave, that is pan-shaped, and the loaf formations being convex, like a loaf. Rocks fractured by the movement of the earth have since been eroded by the waves and sediment of the Tasman Sea. It is fascinating stuff but you really can't imagine just how spectacular it is until you're standing right there. Port Arthur was a convict settlement from 1830 to 1877. Most of the convicts were sent to the island from England. Some were sent from Ireland, even North America. The historic site of Port Arthur contains 30 or more buildings that made up the original settlement. There was a hospital, church, officer's quarters, an insane asylum, a guard tower, and more. All of the structures, except for the insane asylum built later, were constructed by convict labor. By 1846, over 3,500 men were incarcerated on the peninsula, of whom 1,200 were at Port Arthur. Inmates included not only secondary offenders, but also gentlemen convicts and political prisoners, such as the Irish Member of Parliament who lived in this cottage. After Port Arthur closed for convict purposes in 1877, a burgeoning tourist trade began.
we made our way north to the Midlands, to the historic town of Ross. Convicts in the 19th century were often put to work in public infrastructure projects, building bridges such as the classic Ross Bridge here, constructed in 1836. It was designed by John Lee Archer. The details of its 186 carvings by the convict stonemason Daniel Herbert were deemed of such high quality that he was later given a pardon. It has the distances to both Hobart and Launceston, carved into the stone on either side facing the road. Several years later, Herbert settled in Ross, a town reminiscent of an English Cotswold village with its warm Ross sandstone. Oatlands is another quaint heritage town in the Midlands with over 80 beautiful old sandstone buildings, including Callington Mill. The mill was first built in 1837 and restored in 2010. It is the only working wind-powered flour mill in the Southern Hemisphere. The town also boasts scenic Delverton Lake, where we enjoyed watching the black swans. Throughout our travels in Tasmania, we had picked up on the range of mailboxes, from the formal boxes in Hobart, to a homemade fish on Bruny Island, to an old industrial piece on the Tasman Peninsula. But when we entered the north part of the island, we encountered a whole new level of sophistication. From this night in front of a windmill house, to the cow on a rural road. To my favorite, a pig with four little legs, just below Mount Roland. Before arriving in Launceston, or Lonnie, we stopped at a nearby Pick Your Own Strawberry Farm, Hillwood, to enjoy the summer's bounty. Arriving in Lonnie, we checked out the downtown with its famous Bogues Beer Brewery. Arriving late in the afternoon at Kurjong House, in the hills above the city, we were made to feel right at home by our B&B host, Julian Graham. We settled into the Grand Adelaide Room. Julie booked us a table at Stillwater, one of the top restaurants in Tassie. Our palates were in heaven as we dined on three courses. The next morning, we enjoyed a substantial English breakfast, or brekkie, before heading off to see some Tasmanian devils up close. We visited Tasmania Zoo, outside Launceston, to learn about the island's most iconic creature, the Tasmanian Devil. The world's largest surviving carnivorous marsupial is endemic to Tasmania. Devils are the size of a small dog with powerful jaws. In the wild, they have a life expectancy of five years. Unfortunately, an aggressive facial cancer has obliterated overall devil numbers. Uh, these guys, as you can see, are quite small, uh, so there's not much they can do to defend themselves. The only way they can defend themselves is by climbing. At this age, they're just like little possums. Now, uh, if one of these little guys came across an adult devil that was going to hurt them, uh, what these guys would do, they would go straight up to the top of a tree, and then that's where they stay nice and safe. They're excellent little climbers. Uh, so the bigger older devils, they're too big and they can't support their own weight and uh, so they're very, very safe up in those trees. Now uh, once they get past their first year of life surviving off eating bugs, plant material, rats and mice and things like that, they'll be two years of age and they're able to take care of themselves. Now uh, when they do get the age of two years and uh, over, they are, they're solely scavengers so they'll survive off eating carrion which is dead animal or dead meat so, uh, and they'll make the, the majority of their diet and that's what we're feeding these guys today, just some uh, dead meat. 
but uh, nice fresh stuff, not nice, not diseased things. But uh, in the wild, these guys would have to travel like to 10 kilometers every single night to search for food in order to sustain themselves. And uh, so that's a very, very long way for such a little devil. But it's what they have to do because food pickings when you're a scavenger is pretty slim. And uh, so what these guys will do when they do find something, they will eat everything. They will eat the fur, bone, teeth, claws, fingernails, scales, all the insides, you name it, a devil will eat it. And uh, that's how they make the most out of their food. There you go, what's that? Mm -hmm. There we go. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what these guys would do in the wild, once the devil came across the carcass of a wallaby or a kangaroo, as soon as they find that big carcass, what they do is they scream. Now, uh, if you ever heard a devil scream, they're pretty loud and horrific. And uh, what that does is attract other devils in... <laughs> I tracked over devils in the area to the carcass uh, because one devil by him or herself can't really disembowel an animal uh, because their jaws and their teeth are designed for crushing. Now, uh, if you notice the devil's teeth, they're all relatively fat, flat, except for those four front canine teeth, uh, which they use to lock on uh, because these guys, just like a pit bull, they have a lock jaw system. So what's the, that's what they do. They all lock onto a different side, pull in different directions and just rip the animal apart. Now, uh, for such a small animal to dispose of all those bones and things like that, uh, they've evolved with a massive jaw pressure. Now, uh, they have 12 times the bite of a pit bull and the second largest jaw pressure of any land mammal in the world. Uh, so extremely powerful. You really don't want to get bitten by one of these little guys. And uh, combined with that locked jaw, uh, very, very dangerous. So, uh, yeah, it's, can, it's a very good idea to stay away from the from the front area. Now, uh, as you can see, they're ripping into that meat pretty well. That's the way. Good on you. Now, uh, these guys in the wild, they're in a lot, a lot of trouble at the moment. Uh, the Tasmanian Devil uh, is uh, declining very, very quickly now. Uh, since 1996, uh, we have lost 80 to 90% of our devil population here in Tassie. Uh, so the mysterious and rare form of contagious cancer is thought to spread through the devils biting each other while squabbling for food, which is their natural eating habit. Witness these three six-month-old devils pulling apart the carcass of a wallaby. Once seen as a threat to livestock and prized for its pelt, only official protection in 1941 stopped the devil from being hunted to extinction, a fate that had already befallen its close relative, the Tasmanian tiger, in 1936. To try and build up a good insurance population, which we can re-release back into the wild, and they'll hopefully get their numbers up, but unfortunately, we can't start releasing until we know the disease has gone. And the only way to know that is to know that every devil from the wild is gone. So that's why they will be extinct from the wild and there's nothing we can do about it. It's just the way it is. So, not a real lot we can do. There are a number of reserves, mostly in Tasmania, but one in the highlands of New South Wales called Devil Ark. Where the plan is to create a population of around 1,500 disease-free devils who can then be re-released into the wild once the current population dies out. We traveled east to the Freshenay Peninsula, stopping along the way at Kate's Berry Farm, where we had some of the best blueberry pie I've ever tasted. We entered Freshenay National Park and checked into the namesake lodge enjoying the rustic location of our comfortable accommodation. There are some lovely walks near the lodge, including one to Honeymoon Beach. The next morning, we joined a cruise to Wineglass Bay, considered one of the best beaches in the world. The cliffs on the way were made even more beautiful with their orange lichen. Some people say Wine Glass Bay is named for its shape. Others say for its 19th century whaling history. Wine Glass Bay. Now, folks, just off the uh, left hand side here, between the last point between these two mountain ranges. As our visit neared its end, we stopped by the town of Railton, famous since 1999 for its animal and character topiaries. Our
I end this film driving around Mount Roland, heading in the direction of our next trip to Tasmania, where we will explore the Cradle Mountain, Strawn, and Stanley regions of the west and northwest of the island. Till then, sweet voyage. <laughs>